Welcome to Ardias. Today we have a very special show. We are going to take you to Versailles. Within the mind of a child, a dream sparked to create a legacy of grandeur that would awe the world for centuries. When Louis XIV began visiting the present site of Versailles, it was strictly a hunting camp void of the ideal luxuries that you would expect for a king. But during one of his visits, he had a vision of building a magnificent palace that would serve as a seat of government, not just for France, but the world. But it was not until the death of his advisor, Cardinal Marzan, in 1661, that he could begin his plans for building the unbelievable. To fulfill his dream, he brought in the landscape gardener, Lenot, the architect, Laveau, and the painter, Lebrun, who spent the majority of their lives bringing Louis XIV's vision into reality. In 1668, the architect Laveau was commissioned to begin enlarging the chateau on the garden side by building a stone envelope around the existing structure but retaining the marble courtyard in the front. Along the courtyard, you will see antique busk welcoming visitors, with a beautiful clock in the center with Roman figures on either side. From the beginning, Louis XIV decided to use the image of the sun to symbolize the duties of a king. Throughout Versailles, you will see sculptures, paintings, and wood paneling with mythological references all tying back to Louis XIV's image of portraying the power of the gods. Why the, the king chose Apollo as a symbol? Because Apollo was the god of the arts. And uh, around the king, uh, you can find so many artists like painters, sculptors, uh, gardeners, manufacturers, so uh, it could be the, the, the right image for the king uh, as a protector of the art and also as a promoter of the art. It was a manner for the king to show how he was powerful. And uh, um, for example, uh, the subjects who can see uh, in the different sailing in Versailles are a mythological subject and it's always, you have always a comparison between mythological subject and the life of, of the king. For example, uh, in this room, the, the most famous Hall of Mirrors, all the sailing is uh, a story of the king and a story of his uh, um, story as a warrior uh, against Europe. So uh, the artists were in Versailles to explain how the king was powerful and uh, they create for him so many paintings, sculpture uh, as a demonstration of this power. The first major renovation began with the North Wing in 1685. The state apartments and the king's apartments were designed and filled with rare marble, antique sculptures, furniture made out of exotic woods and inlaid with gold, and paintings of the finest quality. The Hercules Room replaced the third chapel built for the chateau in 1682. The construction began in 1712 under the guidance of Robert de Carte, but was stopped by the death of Louis XIV in 1715, and was continued by Louis XV in 1729 and completed in 1736. The walls of the Hercules Drawing Room are covered with marbles of different colors. The mantel has beautiful gold gill carving. The painting on the ceiling is one of the largest in the world. This masterpiece by Francois Lemoy earned him the title of head painter for Louis XV. The painting depicts the apotheosis of a Hercules. As we walk into the Room of Abundance, you will notice a beautiful painting on the ceiling by René Antoine Hossé called Royal Splendor and the Progress of the Fine Arts, depicting the rare items from the collection of curiosities, which can now be found in the Louvre. The Venus Room served as the main entrance to the State Apartments. The walls are cased in marble with a fake perspective by Jacques Rousseau to create the illusion of a larger room. This room was to emphasize Louis XIV's appreciation for the gods of love. There is a beautiful statue of Louis XIV in antique attire as a Roman ruler that was created by Jean Warren. The Diana Room served as a billiard room. Louis XIV loved to play billiards and was considered a master of the game. The painting on the ceiling by Gabrielle Blanchard depicts Diana in her chariot ruling over the hunt and navigation. In the center of the room, you will find a bust of Louis XIV by Bernini in 1685. This statue is another fine example of how Louis XIV wanted to be remembered as powerful, wise, and almost immortal. The Mars Room served as the guards' room, 
giving the decor a distinctive military look. Under Louis XIV, this room was filled with luxurious silver furniture, which was melted down to pay for the League of Augsburg War. It was here in the evening that the king held court. In the center of the ceiling, you will see Mars in a chariot drawn by a pack of wolves. This was painted by Aldan. On the wall hangs a painting of Maria Lazinska, who was married to Louis XV. On the opposite side of the room hangs a famous painting of Louis XV in his coronation robes. Originally, the Mercury Room was an antechamber, but was later converted into a state bedchamber. The ceiling was painted by Jean Baptiste Champagne, with Mercury on his chariot with the morning stars. On the wall in the center of the room hangs a tapestry, which is a wonderful example of the complicated tapestries that were created in the 17th century. This tapestry was part of a set called the History of the King. It represents the king's audience to the papal legate at Fontainebleau, and it also gives an idea of what a 17th century royal chamber was like. The clock standing in the corner was created by Antoine Morin and was presented as a gift to Louis XIV in 1706. The exquisite chest of drawers was made in 1709 by André Charles Boulet for the king's bedroom at the Trianon. The Apollo room was one of the finest drawing rooms, serving as a throne room. The ceiling represented Apollo in his chariot. It is the work of Charles Le Fossé, a student of Le Brun. During the 18th century, a tradition was begun, with the painting of Louis XIV by Rigaud hanging opposite the portrait of the reigning king. The last reigning king was Louis XVI, who was painted by Calais. As we walk through the Apollo room, we enter the war room. You will see on the wall a huge stucco bas relief of Louis XIV riding horseback, celebrating his victory surrounded by two gilt figures representing fame. As you turn from the boss relief, your mind stops to capture the wonderful view of the Hall of Mirrors. During the 18th century, mirrors were extremely expensive, so to even own a small vanity mirror was considered a luxury. So for a full room to be covered with mirrors was beyond what the average mind could comprehend. The Hall of Mirrors was begun in 1678 under the direction of Mansart, taking seven years for completion. As light streams in from the garden, the room takes on almost a magical glow of light, making the faces of the candelabra almost seem alive. Twenty chandeliers of silver bronze are embellished with bohemian crystals, are constant reminders of the lighting necessary for hosting official festivities and balls in the Hall of Mirrors. As you look up at the ceiling, you are once again transported into the imagination of the artist Le Brun, who tells the story of the personal reign of Louis XIV. The gallery is decorated with antique Roman busts and sculptures. Normally the gallery served as a passageway for the king to reach chapel each morning for mass. So the Hall of Mirrors was always filled with courtiers trying to catch the favor of the king. As you walk through the Hall of Mirrors, you will arrive on the south side of the palace. The first room is the Peace Drawing Room, showing Louis XIV bringing peace to Europe, painted by Francois Lemoy in 1729. The room is adorned with beautiful gold gill bas reliefs over the doors, and antique busts are placed throughout the room. The last to occupy the Queen's apartments was Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette hired Gabrielle to design her bedchamber. It was here every morning where she would grant audiences. This room is also where she would give birth to the heir of the throne. This bedroom was recreated as it was on October 6, 1789 when Marie Antoinette was forced to escape from the Parisian mob. The furnishings were made from models of the silks, trimmings, and embroidery made in 1787. The mantel is griot marble and is decorated with engraved bronzes by Forstier. On the mantel stands a bust of Marie Antoinette by Félix Lecomte. The mahogany jewelry case was one of the original pieces from Marie Antoinette's bedchamber and has been returned to its rightful place. We'll be right back with more was where the king and queen dined together publicly. This room also served as a theater and the queen's antechamber. The bottom parts of the walls are lined with marble panels and cornices with gilded consoles. In the corners are large gilded trophies with cupids. The central painting on the ceiling is an old copy of the Taunts of Darius by Le Brun. Along the walls you can see famous paintings of Marie Antoinette with her children and Marie Antoinette dressed in her peasant attire. On the mantel is a reduced copy of Arian Asleep, which is kept in the Vatican. The Queen's guardroom is filled with a variety of marble, 
lining the walls mixed in with a combination of wooden panels with gilt metal vase reliefs by Legault and Massou. As you enter the coronation room, you will see the painting of Napoleon and Josephine's coronation. In the center of the room stands a surveys in bronze porcelain column commissioned by Napoleon to commemorate the Battle of Austerlitz. Religion played an important role in the life of Louis XIV. After marrying Madame du Maintenon, who was a devout Christian, he decided to build a royal chapel that was independent of the chateau. Construction began in 1699 under the direction of Mansart until his death in 1708 and was completed by his brother-in-law Robert de Côté in 1710. The chapel is two stories connected to the state apartments by the chapel room. The chapel room was situated over the vestibule and opened directly to the royal tribune. It shared the same architecture of the chapel with Corinthian columns and the figures of virtue above the doors and windows. The stucco work in the corners of the ceiling represents the four parts of the world. The statues were placed in 1730, Magnanimity by Jacques Bousseau, and fame holding the portrait of Louis XV by Francois Vasset. The chapel was two stories like the traditional Palatine chapels, but its style is classical in design. The artwork draws a parallel to Old and New Testaments. This can be seen in the beautiful reliefs of angels. The vaulted ceilings are in reverence to the Holy Spirit, the resurrection of Christ by Fosse, glory to the Father in the center by Antoine Coipel, and the descent of the Holy Spirit by Juvenet. The high altar is made of gilt bronze by Van Cleve. He also made the bas relief representing the dead Christ on his mother's knees. The South Wing, also called the Prince's Wing, was built between 1678 and 1682 by Mansart. On the outside, it still looks the same, but on the inside, it was converted into the Hall of Battles under the direction of Louis Philippe, who converted the palace into a national museum in 1837. This hall is truly magnificent, stretching 397 feet long and 43 feet wide with exquisite examples of molding with gold gilt and intricate detail. The walls are filled with paintings depicting famous battles, and sculptures line the hall with famous military leaders. When we return on Art Is, we'll take you into the King's Apartments. some pep back into your step with the YMCA's Personal Exercise Program, a 12-week program designed to fit your personal health and wellness goals. For a limited time, pay only $49 to join any of our five locations, and your next monthly payment is due March 1st, 1999. Our staff invites you to experience the excitement and the newness of our facilities with our many expanded programs and services. The YMCA has something for everybody. The YMCA, we build strong kids, strong families, strong communities. I wish we could call home to check on Jimmy. Yeah. Ahoy! We can call Jimmy from here. I'm Dan with Bell South Mobility, bringing reliable wireless service to everyone. Well, we have a cell phone. It just won't work out here. Well, with Bell South Mobility, you can call from here and most any place in the whole country. Oh! Got any room in there for me? I don't think so. I'll row. Sign up now and give Bell South Mobility's wireless service for as low as $14.99 a month. Oops, I smushed your gherkins. A wife who cheats and a clown who cries. Sometimes love hurts. Mobile Opera presents Yves Pagliacci 
Experience the passionate, emotional intensity of Leon Cavallo's two-act opera, sung in Italian with English supertitles. Two performances only at the Mobile Civic Center Theater, March 18th and 20th at 8 p.m. Call Mobile Opera today for tickets to E. Pagliacci. Under the oaks in Old Spring Hill at the Holiday Place, you'll find a charming shopping village with a variety of specialty shops. The pavilion has a wide selection of pewter wear, delicate crystal, fine china, and exquisite gifts for the home. Come by and experience for yourself the friendly personnel and surprisingly affordable prices at Holiday Place at 4513 Old Shell Road. Like the Queen's Apartments, the King's Apartments consisted of a bedchamber, mainly for public ceremony and the daily rituals attending the King's Rising and Retiring. It was in this room on September 1st, 1715 that Louis XV died. During Louis XV's reign, the bedchamber was strictly used for public occasions. Due to Louis XV's love for privacy, he created his own little world called the Petite Apartments, small, luxurious rooms that were intimate and relaxing. The clock cabinet was a room designed to house the astronomical clock by Passement and the wonderful barometer by sculptor Le Maire. The king's private cabinet was also used as a study for the king, with an exquisite roll-top desk by Resnier. The walls were lined with wainscoting designed by Gabriel and carved by Burbeck. Louis XV also enjoyed a beautiful library with Seth figures representing some of the most prestigious leaders of the time. It's obvious no detail was left unnoticed, from the gold gill paneling with intricate detail work from the exquisite furniture to the finest selection of fabrics for the chairs and draperies. For sure, even though Louis XV was somewhat removed from the public eye, he still enjoyed the luxury of living like a king. Regardless of the reigning king, there was one common thread they all enjoyed, and that was the theater. As a wedding gift to Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, the Royal Opera was built by Gabrielle in 1770. The opera was very modern with a movable floor that would convert the Royal Opera into a ballroom. Unfortunately, after the French Revolution, Versailles was left barren until Louis-Philippe decided to convert Versailles into the Museum of French History. With this in mind, he began collecting authentic works from all periods of French history. I think that there is a part of art, but also a part of, of magic uh, of the history that was part here in the, this castle. There was very, things very dramatic and very uh, uh, full of joy and feast. Those two aspects are so strong that I think that this is the magic of Versailles. Art, to, to me, I think it's my life, so it's not, uh, for me it's very important. <laughs> I've, I've always had the chance to work in the work, a world of the art, so I think if I could give that to my children, I would be very glad. Maybe because it's a tradition, uh, like in Italia, like uh, in Germany, we have a very important pat patrimony, so, uh, and it's important for us to to, um, to give a, a, a good idea about this patrimony and to uh, teach about this. I, I was, uh, I'm in Versailles since uh, four years. It's my first uh, post in, in France and the tradition in, in France about uh, curatorial staff is uh, to uh, begin with uh, a very important post and to uh, organize exhibition and uh, assuring restoration and um, buying some new objects and uh, I have I had elected uh, Versailles because I'm from Versailles uh, during my childhood I was in the garden with my grandfather and uh, it's so wonderful to, to live here every day to, to see all of this works of art, so it's 
a kind of explanation of my presence here. Because my uh, grandparents lived here in Versailles, so I have always been used to hear about Versailles, even the name, when I was a little boy. So now I have the chance to work here, so it's a kind of dream, and I'm very glad to, to now to learn more being inside and to be a possibility to offer a possibility to learn to other people now what we could offer maybe in America with this exhibition. Two wonderful museums in France, the Louvre and Versailles. The Louvre is a museum with works of art, with masterpieces, but without any history. Uh, here it's an house with, with a life, uh, with people, with, uh, with uh, decoration, with so many uh, elements who can, uh, who can imagine how was a life here.